Okay, so I make that five o'clock on the dot UK time, which Erica, you well know, is 12 o'clock your time, right? Because we're good at yes. time zones. <laughs> so we will we will get going. So welcome to um, our session on sketchnoting tips, tricks and application in the classroom. Um, Erica, do you want to introduce yourself first? Um, sure. Hi. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is for you. Uh, my name is Erica Moser. I am a uh, class of 2019, and I um, spend my time teaching elementary music as well as serving as the tech integration specialist at my school. Very good. Uh, I'm Matt Pullen. I am from Wales in the UK. Um, I am class of 2013, officially best class ever. I said it, no one else can say it. Um, I am a senior lecturer in teacher education at the University of South Wales and a part time Apple professional learning specialist um, for a couple of days a week. So that's us. And what we wanted to do today was kind of just talk through how we use sketchnoting, some tips, tricks, um, approaches that we use kind of all the way from the really little learners that Erica works with all the way to the really big learners that I work with at the other end of education. Um, and just to talk about like the approaches that we take, the similarities, the differences, um, but actually, as we've discussed the planning of this, it's more the similarities in approaches. It doesn't matter what age you are, there's certain things that you probably do to help those students all the way through. So at any point, please do ask questions because there's two of us. We're going to take it in turns at talking through things and have a bit of a discussion, um, but also fielding questions from anyone. So feel free to just jump in and, and ask us as we go through. So. Erica, do you want to talk through like what we're going to do in terms of our aims of the session? All right. So the idea with today, as Matt had said, is what are the similarities between early learners as well as higher ed? So what we kind of wanted to focus on is the big why. Why would you sketch note with your learners in your learning environments? How do you go about doing these things? Um, who benefits from this? Is it just our students or is it us as educators as well? And what, what's the purpose in doing all of this? So with that, we want to just kind of like focus on those ideas and go with a little bit of an icebreaker challenge, which uh, Matt has challenged live with me. <laughs> so what we're gonna do is um, jump on and ask you to use whichever um, app you prefer to do your drawing in, but we're gonna give you two minutes without one of those beautiful timers to sketch what you ate for breakfast. And in the meantime, Matt and I are going to give this a go live. Yeah, this was yeah. Erica's idea to do a live, live challenge. All right, so here we go. This was partially the reason why we said like blueberry is not a good idea. Although you might find it really easy to draw lots of blueberries. I forgot to set a timer, Matt, so I hope you're on that. Oh, yeah, I'm counting to 120 seconds in my head. <laughs> we certainly don't want my math. <laughs> so you have one minute left. And whilst you guys are doing that, hopefully you can see um, that, that one of the beauties of doing this as a collaborative is that me and Eric can both draw on the same slide at the same time. So, you know, as as we go through, sort of hold that in mind as well about collaborative sketch noting, because, um, you know, we thought it'd be really fun to have a go at doing it in this way so that we didn't have to sort of keep switching screens. Um, but I think it works really, really nicely, this idea of having that um, collaborative approach. Okay, you got 10 seconds left. All those people regretted their decisions now about what they had for breakfast. Jam and toast is the easiest one to do, by the way. Okay, fab. So, um, 
hopefully you've had a go at that. We would love to see you share these, so please do. You can tweet them out now, um, you know, put them onto Twitter uh, or, or social media. We'd love to see what people come up with. But really, we just wanted to show like how easy the whole process is of creating um, a sketch note freehand, just, just getting stuck into it. And um, we're not artists, although Erica is a lot better than me at drawing. Um, we're not artists, and that's not what sketchnoting is about. Sketchnoting is about just kind of just quickly getting an impression down of what you're trying to achieve. And that's what we're trying to sort of, you know, show through the rest of the presentation today. So what we thought we'd start with is um, we're going to kind of look at this kind of spectrum of learning. So all the way from the young learners in elementary all the way up to higher education. And we just wanted to share some ideas, some things that we do in our classrooms Obviously, we're going to look at the very young all the way to the very old, and there'll be people here that don't teach either end of that spectrum. But obviously, what you can take away is how, how might this work for you? So, Erica, do you want to take it away with the with the young ones and show us some of your examples? Uh, sure. So, as I mentioned, uh, I'm in a K to five elementary school. Um, I do have the privilege of being in an Apple distinguished school, so our learners are in that one to one environment. With that, um, we have a set of, we actually use the Logitech crayons instead of the pencils because, as you know, that cost is two for one there and um, they're a little bit easier when dropped. So, what was important to me with like how we were going to bring sketch noting into the classroom was really focusing and demoing that idea of you don't have to be an artist. And I felt that that really first started with me as a teacher. I am not an artist. Um, I can doodle and draw some little things and often find myself doing that, you know, during staff meetings. But um, as far as actually putting those ideas out there then for my students, that was um, the big step. So I'll just kind of work you through the process of how I introduce this to our younger students and then where it goes by the time they are in fifth grade, which would be about 11 years old. So. I always start with Keynote. So as you guys know, Keynote pages and numbers all have the same functions with the drawing tools. The reason I start with Keynote though is because it's such a familiar interface um, and that's where we do a lot of other projects as well. So it's something that they're comfortable with. The um, idea also of the defined space is really important for them. When you start with that unlimited canvas, it can be intimidating. So having that those defined parameters of where we're going to work in is really important. Not to mention the ease to export. So students can, if they choose to animate their sketch notes, they can send that out as a movie. They can send it as a PDF. Uh, once we're used to Keynote, um, I will have students who like to move into sketch noting in pages. And that's simply because they prefer the vertical orientation of their projects. And moved through that, well, then we are, we're ready to move into numbers where, again, you can organize your designs by the tabs, as you'll see that I have in that example up there. But again, that unlimited space for drawing and mapping out your designs. Um, some of our students will also use Sketch a School, which is, I know I put the dollar signs there, but it is a free app. Um, this is just great if you're, you know, want to focus more on the art skills of it because the drawing tools are a little more advanced. And then um, Procreate. But again, you really don't need those programs. You can do it within keynote pages or numbers. So let me jump to three uses that I wanna highlight that I found have been really successful. Um, I love the idea of sketch noting exit tickets. And this is something that I start out as early as kindergarten. Um, it allows students to reflect on the learning from the you know, subject of the class that we just had they can submit their responses um, non-verbally, right, which is great. And again, um, I provide templates for this, so it helps them work within a framework. As I mentioned, um, half of my time is spent uh, as a music teacher. So I love sketch noting for me. Uh, we used to do these um, squilt, super quiet, uninterrupted listening time. And um, students would kind of just write these written responses. And it dawned on me the ability to connect the lecture to the music and then just kind of have students sketch out what their responses were would be a little bit more powerful. And obviously the connections would be long lasting. 
Um, finally, when students get a little bit older, I love the use of sketch noting in a book report. There's really no reason for our students to be spending hours typing their responses when they can kind of show what they create. So let me jump. Um, Matt, if you could pull me to the idea of the template. So these are a couple, a couple of templates that I already have, like that I keep in a um, members document that I can then pull one of these icons, put them onto a separate doc and send those out to my students. Again, what I like about this template is that the framework is set and they're limited, like they already have that prompt for how they're gonna get started. And it's a really great introduction into like what they would do with sketch noting. So if you go to the next slide, you'll notice one example that I would do with my students at the end of a class is just kind of like get a sense of like, did you understand the content of the day? So it's is your glass half full, half empty, spilling over or bone dry. And this is an example that I grabbed out of Seesaw. And you'll see that obviously the content stuck, it totally made sense and it was overfilling. And this is great because the framework was there and you didn't have to Kind of design your own, but you could get comfortable with how you would um, sketch something. Um, Eric, can I can I ask you? Sorry to interrupt your flow, but like, what's the student response to doing this then compared to doing this in a more traditional way? So when I think about the class, if I were to, you know, there's five minutes left, and we're going to wrap up and assess how the learning went for the day. You're you're going to have those confident comfortable speaking students raise their hand to answer the question. And that show student isn't going to want to say, yeah, I understood exactly what you told me today, or no, that didn't make sense. But having a response like this, where then the students can take it and post it directly into their seesaw, that will allow me to view it for later, comment on and have a separate conversation with that student. It's just a really powerful way to kind of level the um, feedback responses. Um, Sorry, no, slow. that's totally fine. And yeah, you'll have to stop me because I have a tendency to talk way too fast. Like I pulled my clock down, but if I looked, I've probably done my presentation through minutes. So forgive me. <laughs> so um, there's a question. There's a question as well. Um, how do you share this with the students? Do you put it in to Keynote? So yeah. Um, I've done it a number of ways. Um, this is actually a kindergarten example. So I grabbed this icon. I did paste it into Keynote. And then we just share that out with, uh, through Apple Classroom. But again, there would be, um, I could create the individual ones and then share them out as, you know, and you could put them then in your template chooser. So I could be like, all right, hey, you know, today let's do the reflection piece or let's talk about the tape measure. So if you go back um, to one slide, Matt. So if you notice these, these are just, again, a couple of things that I've sketched out for students in the past. Um, the tape measure is actually a really great intro one because basically the kids are just drawing a line where they thought their day landed. The news one gets a little bit more involved because you can draw more detailed pictures and cartoons. I personally love Let's Reflect and I have an example of that coming up because Sometimes a student will draw themselves in that mirror and other times they'll just, you know, kind of put the content in, which I think is really great. And the wall of fame, interestingly enough, though, one of my favorites, uh, students don't really gravitate towards this. For some reason. So I don't know, I'd have to reinvent it for next year. <laughs> uh, actually, I see in the chat about the audio. So that's actually coming up on my next slide. So this is an example of Let's Reflect. And um, if you haven't read the book, The Good Egg, it's absolutely fantastic. Um, I wanna say John, John Gorey, maybe, but I could be wrong on that author. Um, so after doing a session on The Good Egg, I wanted to provide students, I just wanted to kind of get some feedback. I mean, the truth is The Good Egg had nothing to do with music class. But again, because I get to sometimes do you know, I split my time with the tech integration. I thought this would be a great piece to bring in the idea of sketch noting. So after listening to, um, I read them the good egg, it was just like reflecting, like what did you think the author's main theme was here? Like, what did you take from this? So I had a student draw his version of the good egg, which is spot on. And um, he was one of the first to do this. 
he decided to record audio. Um, you know, again, because we are an ADS, we do spend time with the students to kind of know how these applications work and how to embed different files and whatnot. So he went right to the audio recorder and um, added his reflection about what he thought the book was about. So I'm not sure if it'll play, Matt. We'll give it a go. Let's go I'll play it here. No, it's not going to play through the WebEx. So if you can just imagine an adorable kindergartner telling you about how the good egg, the purpose of the book was to um, be kind to others and take care of yourself. And that really great voice with a speech impediment, it was, it was super awesome. Uh, thank you for the correct link to the book there. Um, so that's just kind of an example of how we start with early learners. Now, as the kids and um, spend more time doing these, uh, we move into how you can do other projects. So I'll just kind of jump into how I use it as um, our listening journals for our composer studies. So now I'll confess, this actual example um, is, is my terrible doodling, so please ignore it. And I very quickly stopped demoing what mine looks like, because what I realized is you do have a tendency then to get students who kind of just imitate. But um, this was one of the first examples that we started with. And it was the idea of giving a lecture about Beethoven, just kind of focusing on those important key elements that I wanted you to kind of take. But again, then how you could finish, you know, and the lecture was really about five minutes long. And then we spent some time listening to the first movement of the Fifth Symphony. Um, so the students, I have certain composers assigned for each month of the year. So this is a um, template that I'll share with them in September and then they'll carry it through with them until June. So then by the time the school year is over, they are able to export the PDF, have it in their Seesaw to reference later. Um, and it's just like a really, really great tool to be using in the music classroom. Um, so here's a student example of um, Mozart. See, so I had a guess that was Mozart straight away from without the words, right? Right, so you've got that ridiculous gray wig and that bright red jacket and you see Jupiter and you're good to go. That's all you need, memory connections. Um, so again, obviously, you know, I'm kind of showing you where we start and where we end. And um, I just think I love what students create when it comes to the idea of the book report. When you think about as a, as a teacher, when you're asking your students to write a book report, you want um, a summary of the main themes, you want the story arc, you wanna know about the characters, the conflict, the resolution. And for, learn for certain types of learners, that can be really challenging. But when you give them student choice, and by the way, some students do submit the written report as well, right? It, it, again, it's up to choice. But when you give students the choice, and then how would you tell this story? It, it's pretty powerful. So what I loved about this one was the use of um, memojis to recreate the characters. Um, I wish I had thought of that when I tried to draw Beethoven, because um, that's pretty genius. So this is just an example of what the Hunger Games looks like. And then obviously, you know, I think there's one more here where um, we have an example of Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. And I have to say, if, if I had to create Voldemort, it would look exactly like that. <laughs> but again, you can see, you know, so what were the main themes of the book? What was, you know, what was the storyline? Who were the characters? How does it all connect? Um, so yeah, these are just a couple of examples that um, we're doing. And to do more and more of this in our school, um, I think, again, it's really just a matter of, you just admit, I'm not an artist but I can do this. So, and with that, I'll, I'll stop my rambling and turn it over to Matt. No, it's good. And I think like, exactly as you said, like the artist element of things, it's, it's like when you talk to people about sketch noting, they instantly think, oh, that's what people that can draw would do. And I love seeing them because people will share their fantastic drawings. And, um, but actually, and I, I don't want to brain, uh, like bore people with the science behind it, but but actually it does help you learn and, it, and it's been proven to support memory recall and, and all about dual coding and all of that. So there is actually a really good process behind it. And Alicia, I think you, you pointed out in the chat about um, not copying other people's style because 
sketch noting is about having a personal style and the reason for that personal style is because it's how you think and and when you take the words or the concepts and put it into pictures that's you having to process it and and do something with those words so um my one big issue as i kind of take over the realm now and talk about higher education is note taking in higher education is really boring because it's like taking taking down word for word what your lecturer might have said and that's when i talk to my students it's like that's what they were taught to do that's what note taking should look like and so i try and unpick it and get called like a primary school teacher because i'm drawing pictures all the time and they say, oh, that's that's childish or that's doodling or you're wasting time. The amount of sessions I've been in and I'm doodling and people um, some somewhat feel offended by the fact that you're drawing pictures. It looks like you're not paying attention. And your argument is actually the science would say I'm probably paying more attention to that person over there who's staring at you, but really not probably listening to you. So as we move on, we, we when we planned this, we were kind of talking about the, the similarities of the two approaches and people have picked up this already. I think Carlina, you mentioned about higher ed students needing a scaffold because if you give anybody a blank page for anything, it's scary, right? Where do you start? Do I start in the middle? Do I start on the edges? You know, where where do I start? So these are kind of how I use it in higher ed. And this is um you'll look the pictures don't look like I'm in higher ed. These are my drawings. Um, but this is how I use it. This this actually was from planning presentations so a presentation i had to give back in january at a big conference in london um and th these are my speaker notes so rather than writing speaker notes underneath my slide deck i drew pictures for different elements and had a bit of a structure towards how i would flow around the page and for me it, it helped and, and martin's on the call here we were at an event um last year in glasgow and I had a script I had to remember for something. And I was kind of thinking, I just keep reading the script, reading the script, and it just was not going in my head at all. So in the end, I did something similar to this. I just drew pictures of the different things that I knew I had to talk about. And for me, it helped me have that recall of, you know, what were the main elements? How did I process that? Once it had gone through my short-term memory and into my long-term memory and it had been processed, it was easier for me to retrieve it because, you know, there were there were things there I'd made connections with. But this isn't a science talk, so I'm not going to go into all of the boring detail. Um, the other thing is it's a lot more fun, right? So drawing pictures of things is is a lot more cathartic. It's it's a lot more relaxing when you're doing those things. I don't know if, Erica, you find that with your young learners. If, if like you said, they're at the end of a, a day and you're asking them to do the exit tickets, does it also calm them down? Yeah. So, um, you know, and that kind of connects. Someone was asking about the timer. And I think, you know, again, it all comes back to reinforcing that you don't have to be the artist. But yeah, that individual time to just kind of sit with your iPad and just kind of something out very, very calming, um, especially in a highly energetic environment. Yeah. Yeah, I just find it's really relaxing. So the second the second one, this is actually what I'm doing at the moment. So these are my sketch notes of this festival of learning. So um, it's about how can we use this in uh, sessions with our learners so that they can get the detail. Like I said, my students have very traditionally come to us and they'll think I've got to sit there, I've got to take written notes, I take things word for word. Sometimes you'll get the student who brings in a dictaphone and just literally records everything you're saying. And you just like wonder like why are you doing that because like you're just going to listen to it again at another time it's going to be the same words at another time but in a different environment um, and the idea of taking that word and transferring it into an image of something is the connection you have to the learning it's your way of processing that uh, word and turning it into something which can give you a lot more information so what i've been doing throughout this session is uh well not this session because it would be very difficult for me to sketch note me talking about something um but in all the sessions that i've attended is just using numbers and we'll talk about that in a second to have a different page for each sketch note um session that i'm taking part in so um the first one i attended way back when the festival started was an ar one with lindsay um and that was my sketch note on the takeaways i have and the thing is, it doesn't need to make sense to anybody else. Yes, I will share them um, on social media, but it doesn't need to make sense to anyone else. It's really for me to look back at another time and and sort of, you know, what are the things that resonated with me within that session? Um, 
obviously it's about transferring that visual and the language so i think in there there's a, a nice little picture of be the bee um, and that was something that Lindsay said, like visually when she was talking about augmented reality and sort of going around the outdoor space and pretending you were the bee. So I just turned it into an image. There's there's like, you know, a picture, a very tiny picture of a bee in there. And again, I'm not an artist. You find this a lot with sketch noters, like every other word is I'm not an artist, like you're trying to defend the fact that your, your drawings aren't great, but it really isn't about the drawing. Um, and then the last one to kind of share in terms of this is why I use numbers to do it in this way is because I can simply jump between the tabs similar to Erica showed you before this is a page of things that I think I might use again in another session and I'm the sort of sketch noter who will um draw as I see it and then I'm done and there are other me and Erica were talking about this before there are other people who will kind of do a rough sketch note and then they'll spend some time afterwards tidying it up and making it look nicer and making the connections better. I literally just sketch note a session and, and stick it on Twitter like within a second of, of the session finishing because for me it's the science behind it, not the prettification, if that's even a word, it is now, um, of what it looks like. It's the process. So in speeding up the process of me drawing it within a session, I have a whole tab of icons which i think might be relevant so these have just started building up over the course of of the last week and a bit um, of things that i might want to use again and again this one then is something that i've started to do more recently it's i suppose in the book reviews really but i suppose more detail goes into it in the sense of um these are longer books so this is daniel uh, pink's drive book if you haven't read it i would urge you to use that um and the idea here is these are just the main parts I take out of each chapter. So it's like a chapter review. So same as your book review, but, but I probably go into more detail because this is then what I would build some of my lectures from. And then I would also say to my students that this is a really nice approach. If they're doing research, if they're doing some reading about uh, theory behind teaching, theory behind behavior management, all of those things, then this is a great way for them to sort of just take out those key ingredients, those key messages from the book so that they can then have a discussion with their key, uh, with their peers about this afterwards. Um, that's that's kind of one thing that I really like about this in terms of the social aspect of it that I, I explore with my learners is when they share their drawing and compare it to someone else's, they'll see it from a different angle. People will pick out different elements and visually you can start to have those um, comparisons. So it's a really kind of nice way to kind of approach doing that. And also, because it's numbers, it just keeps everything nice and neat in the same place. So you had the tabs across the top, which talked about the different processes. Mine's just chapters of the book, so that I can just jump from one chapter to the next. And then the last one that I wanted to share um, is something which um, actually was the reason me and Erica started talking, because we were on a, another call a few weeks back, and I talked about this idea of doing sketch noting instead of traditional lesson planning, and it kind of raised a couple of eyebrows in terms of, oh, I like the idea, but I don't think we'd be able to get away with it. Um, I posed this to our student teachers. Um, so they're all undergrads um, wanting to become teachers. They're primary school educators, and this is how I plan sessions. So you've, you've seen my sketch notes on how I would plan um, a lecture or, or a talk at a conference but if i'm also planning like a, a, a lecture that i would deliver to my students for half an hour i would plan it by just drawing pictures because it's just how my brain works and i got talking to some of our students over lunchtime and and um they saw it on my ipad and they were asking about it and they said oh i do something similar to that and the problem is we also expect them to do the long text-based lesson plan as well so what i was finding was some of our more capable students were actually doubling their workload because they would plan in a way that worked for them that enabled them to remember the process and what they needed to do and identify all the key elements of the lesson and then they would spend another hour or so typing it all up and making sure that everything fit in the correct box and all of that so we had a bit of a brainstorm session i spoke to a couple of colleagues in university and we had a bit of a row about whether or not this would pass academic standards and scrutiny and all of those things and we basically came up with with these boxes it has actually changed a little bit recently now with um, a couple of changes with welsh government but fundamentally what we said was for the key things that our students have to be able to demonstrate they understand 
about the students and the process. What is it they're going to teach? Why are they going to teach that? Um, how are they going to teach it? Who are the learners? What have they done before? How are they going to assess it? What do they need? And what are the skills that are coming out of it? And the other reason for having this in kind of this pattern, as we've mentioned already, is they needed some sort of some sort of scaffold. So they needed a place to put some information, but we didn't want to be like a running order. Um, um, I know that there's people here from all parts of the world, but in the UK, and I'm sure this is the same in other places, a lesson plan becomes a kind of routine process driven. You do this at this time, and then you do this at this time, and you do this at this time. And I wanted my students to be a bit more creative with how they plan. So for me, I would probably always start with the learners. So I can start anywhere on this sketch plan. It doesn't really matter. But ultimately, at the end, it's it's all going to be filled up. I gave them a little bit of scaffolding. So we're launching this in September, by the way. So any feedback you have on this would be super fantastic. Um, this is the scaffolding of what we say you would want to put in each of the boxes. There's like a bare minimum of what we want them to do. And then this is what it would look like. So this is your lesson plan. So this one is on um, expressive arts. It's probably for elementary students that you might teach. So you're probably looking at this going, what on earth are you teaching? So this is about color um, and printing. And there's a numeracy aspect to this about moving the, the, um, the plate prints around a certain degree to try to make patterns. It's about matching colors. So thinking about mixing your primary colors and what other colors come up. And and the thing is, like I wrote this, this session plan probably about three months ago. And just looking at it now, I can recall everything that I would want those learners to do. So in the learners box, there's a grid there. The grid is to say that students would need some scaffolding and some support. So I need to create a resource that shows them what 180 degrees is, what 360 degrees is, what 90 degrees is. I know that we're talking about colour. I know in my resources section, I'm going to need some paint pots and I'm going to need an iPad and some paint brushes. And it takes me two seconds to just draw those things. So when we kind of open this up in a second to a little bit of chat, be be really nice to hear some feedback on this because um, I'm kind of putting my neck on the line in university to say this is a new approach to doing something. Um, and we don't know whether or not it's necessarily going to pass, but it is definitely something that I've seen a lot of our students do. And funnily enough, it's from our more able students um, that are doing it this way that that actually seem to have a better flow in the classroom and a little bit more adaptability to respond because they're not following quite a rigid plan. And we also think it'll improve their workload because it is just sketching and doodling, so it doesn't necessarily take quite as long to make sure your commas and apostrophes are all in the same place. So that's that's kind of it in terms of the why, the how, the what, and the when. We wanted to kind of open it up now to have a bit of a discussion. And if you've got any questions, feel free to all unmute at the same time. But if you if you raise your hand or just unmute one at a time, or put your questions in the chat window, we'd love to have a bit of a discussion really about anything you've seen, or if people have got some things to share. I don't know, Erica, if you've monitored the chat and if there's anything anyone said that you'd like to raise. I can see it flying yeah. away, but I'm so panicked about like making sure I don't slip up my words that I, I can't watch that because I'll end up reading out loud. So. And now I think, um, you know, again, when you hooked me with the idea of less the lesson planning sketch note, and that's actually what's really dominating the conversation right now. So, um, yeah, I think just kind of kicking it off with that, if you could actually go back to your slide. So come out. Yeah. yeah, again, um, you know, I just love how the idea of planning, but then I think how we could connect that to even planning any type of project and bringing that into, again, even early learners. Like I've never actually thought about having, you know, it kind of connects to the idea of storyboarding and then how students would be able to kind of like project plan this way as well. And if our teachers start doing it with their planning, then obviously we're modeling that for our learners. And I think it's just really, really powerful. And you talked before about choice as well. So this is not that we're saying all students have to do it this way. We're saying that this is a choice. This is a different way for some of our learners to, to approach something. We know that there's going to be students that are maybe more logically minded, that want that flow. They want that kind of rigid structure because that's how they work. And I think, 
you know, as we try to explore this idea of personalization, you know, we should also appreciate that us as educators have a, a way of doing things which is going to work for us. And so I think that's why I wanted to explore an alternative to planning because like I I struggled the entire time I was in education, as in secondary education as, a, as an educator, planning lessons. They, they just never looked right. I struggled to know what went in each box and it became more of an anxious process to, to do all of that. So actually, when I qualified as a teacher, I just ventured into, you know, I'd have my class planner and there'd be a small space and I would just jot ideas down in there. And this idea actually came more from planning as an APL and sitting with a teacher. And as they were talking through a lesson, I was just doodling what they were talking about. And it kind of ended up looking like a lesson plan, but integrating the digital. And the, the teacher said, oh, I love that that approach. I'm creative. So I'd love to be able to plan that way. And that kind of got me thinking about, you know, that alternative way to do something. Just so I think one thing people are talking about is the idea of they struggle with how do you listen to a lecture and how do you sketch note at the same time? And that it gets very caught up in the, I can't quite focus on what the presenter is saying because I'm too busy sketching or, or I run out of time. So I'm just curious, how did two minutes feel when we asked you to sketch your breakfast? Did it feel like enough time? Did it feel like, oh my goodness, time's up, I can't believe it. Did it create anxiety? Does anyone want to come off mute and answer? Hi, Erica, it's Rachel. There we go. Hi, Rach. Hi, yeah. Um, I'm not the world's greatest sketch noter, um, but and I and I think you do get kind of nervous sketch noting and missing things. But Matt said something earlier on, which is um he picks out the pertinent points from the the things that resonate with him and draws those down. He doesn't try to draw the whole shebang. Really understand what I mean by that, the whole thing. <laughs> um, but I was just saying to um, someone in the chat that you can start by um, sketching the book. That way you don't have to worry too much. You know, you can go as slow as you like. And then maybe you can go on to sketch noting a TED talk and pause the TED talk. Then you can pause and rewind and all that kind of stuff and do a few of those. And then eventually you'll get up to speed and you'll be able to listen and draw. Um, so there are ways you can practice, but it does make you feel nervous. And, and actually at the last ADE meet in Holland, I didn't do any sketch noting because I kind of fallen out of practice. Um, so I'm using Festival of Learning to try and get back into it. Nice. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think um, I'm the same. I'm not an artist. Um, I think something that I try to do is oops i try to think about the um like you said the key words that are coming out of what's being said and i think that for me is is why you work with that retrieval practice element you know i'm not focusing on absolutely everything that's being said at the time now there are drawbacks to this don't get us wrong that there, there are times when you actually just genuinely want to watch the session there are times that i've been sketch noting the showcases and you miss like those awesome moments of of a child's face on the screen that you're and, and I'm not paying attention because I'm too busy sketching something. So you know it's not it's not great for everything. The other thing I'd say, um, and your point about like pausing a video and sketch noting what you said, that's a great that's great as practice. Um, the Daniel Pink uh, book, obviously there's a different element there. I'm reading a book and then I'm stopping like after a, a, a paragraph or something thinking, ah, oh, that's, that's something that I want to, to remember. It's something that I want to share with my students. And I think in this time of lockdown, that's come out a lot more because I'm trying to read a lot more because maybe I've got a little bit more time to do that. Um, and I know that the stuff I'm reading now, I'm going to want to take back to university for, for the new term with the students. And so how am I going to remember those key points? And funnily enough, there's an element in the in the Daniel Pink timeline. Um, I don't think I've got it on this screen, actually. Uh, no, I haven't. Which is like a timeline of motivation. And actually, I've started to use that in other presentations I do now because it just sums it up. It's it's really, really quick and easy way of me to be able to share some of the more pertinent points and things. Um, so, yeah, I, I think maybe it would be interesting to have a look at artists as sketch noters compared to non-artists as sketch noters in terms of that sort of worry about getting all of that information but again 
like I think Josh, I think you put put a, a link in there about some of the research behind this. You know, it, it is a very scientific process. Um, I did uh, my master's actually on sketch noting and the retrieval practice. And thank you, Rachel. I'll say it publicly to you now. You, you let me use some of your sketch notes and Martin to talk about in my research. And it is a very personal process, but it is a process that does help you remember the things that you've done with just a, a visual sort of reminder of those things. So, yeah, that's really good. Um, yeah, I was going to say, um, and I think that's really important. The sketch note doesn't have to make sense to someone else. It has to make sense to you. It's your visual interpretation of the of the content that you want to remember. So if you look at half of my sketch notes, you, you would assume you'd have no idea what I was thinking. But but I can recall that information, and that and that's the key. Yeah, I've I heard someone talk about sketch noting before. Sketch if you. Um, it's hard, it's hard to teach people how to sketch note because like you said they end up just repeating or, or copying what you do which is actually just as bad as if you just write down the words i say so sketch noting is a personal thing and you just have to work on a process i know that brad carter in 20s i'll get the dates wrong 2014 i think introduced sketch noting to me at um san diego institute um and that year I tried it and it was messy and i look back at some of my old sketch notes now and they are just ridiculous but I still remember what I was sketch noting about, even if they look really, really rubbish. Um, I still remember the whole process and I remember what I was sketch noting about. So it definitely has an impact. Um, before we move on to our last little section, Erica, is there any tips that you would give to someone if they were starting to sketch note? I know sort of I'm just checking on the chat now. There's lots of people sort of talking about their um their approaches, their styles. What what's your sort of top tips if someone wanted to get started with this but was really nervous um so i always call my students early learners but when i think about the idea of an early learner it's really anyone who's new to something right so i i take it i take it slow i really think and i had just commented to kate in the chat i wish i forgot to mention earlier so one of the reasons my students do start in keynote is because they're comfortable with that interface and they can grab shapes and they start with shapes and then they learn how they can draw on top of those shapes. And then before they realize it, they're like, hey, Keynote doesn't have that shape I'm looking for. And it's like, all right, so why don't you try to draw it yourself? And, you know, again, it's just kind of building up until you're comfortable before you know it. You're like Matt's examples. He's just jumping into this huge space, no boundaries in um, numbers and, and just going for it. Not quite. I do. Uh, there are there are some boundaries to it, like my own creative ability is a boundary. Um, I think for me, one tip that I do when I first started doing this, I would actually grid up my page, not necessarily in the style that you did, where they were really nice in terms of like the mirror for reflection, but just literally splitting the page up into six sections. Um, and if I was doing anything, I would do it as if I was telling a story. So when I listen to someone talk, I will think about you know, I want to I want to know who they are. So there'll be a box which will be about the person, then be a box about what the issue is that they might be sharing with me, and then there might be a few boxes about that kind of their um, their approach, and then the final box would be a summary of you know my key takeaways. And usually that last box I will do afterwards as I have time to reflect on it. But that's definitely when I first started doing things. It was you know it does need to be scaffolded, and I think the one takeaway I would say to anyone having a go at this. Either yourselves or are also aware that there are a lot of people in here that sketch note themselves anyway, but might be thinking, how can I do this with my students? Is you do just need time. So, um, what we're going to move on to before we let you go is actually we talked about some challenges to do. So, this is courtesy of, of Martin, really, because I watched his shortcut session and he talked about these um, challenges. So, the challenges that we've got here that we think would be awesome for you to have a go at yourselves um and you can follow the qr code to get to this shared numbers document and we're going to try this and see if everyone can get in at the same time is we've just put six challenges on the screen so if i if i zoom in so you can see it in more detail just activities to maybe get you started so um sketch your day so what have you done in a day maybe use numbers for a new tab for each day of the week so just a bit of a reflection what were the key takeaways 
something nice and easy that you can um, draw a picture of. Um, my example there is I start my day in bed, I sit in front of my computer, and then I go back to bed. That's a pretty easy thing to sketch. And then I could just copy and paste that across seven pages of numbers. And there you go, there's my week sorted out. Um, I've talked about like uh, sketching from a book. Obviously, um, Erica talked about a book review. So you could take your favorite book and just sketch what are the key things. You know, I'm sure there's some people out there that could do awesome book reviews of the Gruffalo and you could have a lovely little uh, journey as a Gruffalo walking through and what does a Gruffalo do? What are the key parts of that book? Similar sort of theme, your favorite TV show, um, Netflix, I'm sure everyone has been glued to over the last uh, few months of lockdown. Uh, it seems that way anyway, but could you sketch your favorite TV show? And then with this one, I've kind of added another challenge in there as well. You're not allowed to tell us what it is anywhere. We have to guess. So this is one I'd love to see people share their things out on Twitter. Um, and we can make this a bit of a community challenge, have a play, something fun. But then maybe people can have a guess at what it is that you've created. Um, as I've been doing, you could sketch an ADE session, see how you get along with that kind of listening and what are the key points that you take away from those things. Sketch a tip. So a one pager, what's your number one iPad or Mac tip? Keep it simple. What would you say to someone in just an image? What could you do um, on their device? Um, and then the final one, if you really want to get detailed, is what is your COVID journey? So you could do a whole sketch note of the last three or four months of your life talking about that ups and downs of all those things you've been on. So Eric, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to the challenge element and what people might come up with. Sure uh, no, right. feel free to add your breakfast to that sketch your day though, because yeah. I am looking forward to seeing Liz's blueberries. <laughs> and you had a hashtag for this, correct? I did, yes. We were going to keep it simple with hashtag ADE sketchnote. Um, I think it's been used before at previous sessions. Um, so we thought, do you know what? Let's keep it nice and simple. Um, and please do have a go. It would be great to see what people come up with. I can't oh, write. And if you want to um, add your Twitter handle to your sketch or feel free to bring in your Memoji so there is a you know, face to that sketch, it would be great. Okay, so we've got um, a few minutes left. I'm going to jump into that numbers document and see if anyone's been brave enough to have a go yet. Um, if you want to ask any questions, feel free again to unmute yourself. We are more than happy for the noise. Oops, more than happy for the noise now as people start to come off. Um, and you can just tell us what you've, uh, what ideas you might have for your own classrooms. Or you go, Martin's in because you already look at that. Better jam on toast than mine. So hopefully you've enjoyed the session. We will we will stick around for a bit. If you want to um, ask us any questions or if anyone's got anything they want to share, I will continue to jump through this document as people are adding in um, what they've created. And you can, you know, the, the conversation can carry on after this. You can reach out to us on Twitter um, and, you know, we'd love to see what you guys come up with. Loving your work, Martin. See if anyone else has been brave enough to go in. Not yet. You don't need to take a page each. You can you can add to someone else's. You know, it's a collaborative document. It'd be fun to see what people come up with. Erica, any any closing points from you? Um, no. I'm I'm trying to think if there was anything at last minute. Oh my gosh! And I forgot to tell you moment, but I I really don't think it is. Um, again, I think it's a super super powerful tool and at least for me um it's just one of those things that i love giving my learners to kind of just put in their toolbox or just another way that they can you know um focus and, and share what they learn and retain so i think i think that's about it yeah i'm curious about this toast y'all keep drawing though M matt yes rachel and um I was wondering if um, everybody would like to try the um, chicken scribble challenge on their iPads just to prove that no matter what you draw, it kind of works. Are we are we up for that for five seconds or so? Why not? Go for it. Okay, so everybody, sorry to, to jump in on your session. No, 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 it's, it's a community. Come on, that's what it's all about. 
Um, so everybody, I'll turn my video on so you can see me. Um, everybody needs a, a plain, plain page or whatever you're drawing on. And you just need to randomly draw a scribble just on your page. Do that now. Who is this who's drawing? Is that you who's drawing? That's me, yeah. Okay. And then you need to look, your scribble needs to probably be a little bit bigger than that. But anyway, you need to look at your scribble and decide where you're going to put your chicken's eye. Okay. And you need to give your chicken a beak. <laughs> I can't draw a beak. <laughs> What's a beak look like? Oh, yeah, looks like a snake. <laughs> That's it, brilliant. You need to put some two legs on it. And a wing and a tail somewhere. Oh, what if my scribble already has a tail? Does that count? Okay, if that's okay, you can adapt and overcome. Hey, Eric, at least yours isn't live on the webcast, right? I know it is. Your screen's just really large. I was I was accepting the challenge and doing it with you. Oh, yeah. yeah. There we go. Oh, no. I want to hide yours now because yours looks better than mine. But the but the point is that um, so you've both drawn chickens and they might not look like chickens to me, but because you've drawn them and, and in your head that's a chicken, then that will forever be a chicken. Does that make sense? So it doesn't really matter how brilliant your drawing is or isn't. Then uh, because you've drawn it and in your head that's a chicken, then you know that's that's what it is. Does that make sense? Makes perfect sense. Only can I just say in my head that is not what a chicken looks like. I think yeah, Matt, okay. you, sorry about Matt, I think we use dragons or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a great chicken. Um, but it's a good way to start off with kids. Yeah, and I think, can I just say, again, like me and Eric sort of demoed this before about the collaborative kind of space of doing things. I love the collaborative space and being able to sketch all at the same time in the same place. And um, again, kind of, we did this as part of a, an ADS, ADE web, webinar probably about four weeks ago it feels like longer than that now um, and everyone was kind of just enjoying this kind of you get creative but you can see other people being creative at the same time and it can inspire people to do things in different ways and that kind of community approach to things so thanks Rachel I love that you're welcome oh, Kelly Gillis has just said her her toast looked more like a chicken than her chicken which is that's good <laughs> We're all friends here. It's not like this is being recorded. Oh, here it is. Sorry. Guys, please uh, carry on. Carry on the conversation afterwards. Uh, it's lovely as we've got this now as a shared document. Lovely to see as people kind of build things and, and add in their own uh, responses to what we've done. Um, it would be, be awesome to see people start to share these out on Twitter. Um, oh, okay. Question from Chris. Uh, do older learners miss out on detail by doing sketch noting like this? Um, again, it's their choice, Chris. So um, it's not like I tell them they have to. Um, what I do find is though, that we'll have some students who'll sit there and just stare at you blankly for the whole hour you might be talking. And equally, they aren't engaging in anything. What I find is if you are listening and sketching at the same time, there is an element of that information that you're having to process because you're you're pushing yourself to do it. If you were just writing down everything someone said, there's no real brain power having to go into that. It's just regurgitating the word and, and I copy down the word. Having to turn it into um, a picture obviously takes a lot more brain processing. So that's, I don't know. I don't know if they do or they don't, but I know that the ones that sit at the back don't, don't do either. So. I was going to say one thing that I've noticed is that um, younger younger learners just kind of embrace it right away. Uh, they do have a tendency to be a bit detailed oriented, but um, you know they just kind of jump in and they still operate. They don't have any ideas of you know you ask an adult if they can draw, and you've heard all of us say, "Oh no, we can't draw. We're not artists." Well, the truth is is that we can draw. We just have these qualifications on it of whether or not we do it well. So the younger kids just kind of jump right in and do it. Um, the older kids are the ones that are a little more reserved, um, you know, have a tendency to take a bit more time and then maybe do get distracted and miss some of the content um, that's delivered because they are so focused on what they're doing. 
Yeah, and I think like to my point earlier about the, the unteaching them what note taking looks like and getting over their fear of doing something different. So uh, a lot of the students obviously think that note taking is done by writing words because that's what they were taught for the last, you know, ever since they left Erica's class, they were taught like just use words now because you know words, so use words. Um, but actually, you know, we learn things through pictures. Right. So if you're teaching a child language, you use pictures and you use words with it. This this is the same thing. We're just doing it. It's just a, a more grown up approach. So we go. I'm sure we could just keep like talking forever about these things. And then Rachel will come back on and give us another like doodle challenge, which is really cool. But um, I know that other people have got other sessions they want to go to. So thank you very much for, for joining in um, and look forward to sort of working with people throughout the festival and seeing people in, in person, like hopefully like sometime soon would be cool. And thank you, Erica, for joining me on this session. Thanks. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. And, and I got the time right, so super happy about that. Yes, yeah, I was worried you might turn up an hour late, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone. All right, thank you.